Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are around the world. Welcome to Magic the Gathering. But today, we are going to talk about something that's a little different from what we usually do here. Usually, I'll do a draft, play a deck, explain the deck, explain my draft choices, play some games. We're not going to be directly playing some games today. Instead, we're going to be discussing a very important aspect of gameplay. How do you beat what people are expecting? The meta. The stuff that you know everybody's going to come jam-packed with, ready to kill you with. You see this chariots and all runs, epiphanies and omnaths of the world. How do you analyze playing around those cards? Do you try to bring in specific hate cards? Do you fill your main deck with specific hate cards? And of course we all know. But if you just do that, then you're going to give up your win percentage against other decks, against which the lead card might not be as good. So how do we consistently craft decks that have what it takes to compete in saturated competitive formats where pros and grinders and net deckers have all come together to figure out what the best cards and the obviously good decks are in the first two to four days of the format? How do we then take our cards that we like to play and assess whether it is of a power level to be worth playing? And if it is of a power level to be worth playing, then how does it pair up against and beat what everybody else in the meta is doing? So we'll, we'll start with a few examples to illustrate this. Example number one, let's talk about this monstrosity. A Seeker's Chariot. Caught his little knight. Um, in alchemy, they nerfed it so that it makes only one to do, but it's also crew two. The reason that's a nerf is because now when you kill the chariot or trade against the chariot, you don't still leave your opponent with four power toughness on the board. <laughs> Part of the reason this is so played, so heavily played everywhere, is because it's a threat that makes multiple other threats and will almost always require multiple cards from the opponent to kill. If you're playing just removal spells, Blood Chief's Thirst, Fatal Push, Abrades. All of those cards will only deal with one half of Zika's Chariot. Sometimes not even that. Blood Chief's Thirst can never kill the Chariot. You can try and pick off tokens one by one, but that's such a losing position because it will just keep making more tokens. But it's not just a four mana card that also makes a couple of tutus. It's a four mana card that can make two twos and then copy those two twos. So in a vacuum, this can flood the board by itself. When you combine it with other tokens, most famously with Ren and Seven, you have this nonsense where on turn five, you have a planeswalker, a powerful vehicle, and two five fives, and the tokens that Ezekiel Sherry has left behind. Just these two cards alone create such an insane game state. And the Seeker's Chariot is just like that. <laughs> Wherever it comes down, because of its ability to copy the best token that you can generate at the moment, it can create a massive amount of value. So killing the Chariot is important to stop the token copying, but if you kill the Chariot, you're left with two two twos. So it's like you're almost always going down in resources when you try to trade against the Seeker's Chariot. Like, let's say you just trade against it in combat. You put four powers worth of power and toughness, four creatures worth of uh, four points of power and toughness in front of it, and you trade. Again, same problem, right? You're now leaving your opponent with still two two twos that can get bigger, that can attack you, that can get sacrificed, that can do all sorts of things. <sighs> it's a mess, and it's very very powerful. The only thing holding it back is legendary, but the fact that it makes two two twos on ETB means even when your opponent draws multiple copies, they can still just play it as two two twos. Worst case scenario, that's still pretty damn good. So essentially in order to make sure that your opponent can never use a sequence chariot, you either have to kill the chariot right away and suck it up that it's gonna leave two two twos behind, or you can just I I I don't I don't know. And that's the problem right there. There's no you can just fill in the blank there. There's nothing you can just obviously do that beats this outside of just countering it. And obviously you're not only going to be playing blue, and you're also not going to always be able to have the counterspell for Zika's Chariot. So how do you beat the Zika's Chariot? 
Now this card is by no means unbeatable. Many people have been playing it, many people have played and lost to it. This card is obviously not great on defense. It's okay, right? Choo 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 slash a 4 4. So when it comes down, this is part of why it's strong, is let's say you have a 3 2 or a 3 3 that you were attacking with before. Um, even outside of just them throwing two two twos in front of your three three, the two twos can just crew a four four and eat your three three. So it's pretty good on defense against little creatures. Obviously, it's not as good as on defense when both people have developed out their boards and both people have, um, or at least you have creatures that are larger. Both people might at that point have creatures larger than Zika's share. It doesn't really shine there. Um, but for a turn four play, it is incredible. And if off of something like a prosperous innkeeper. You curve prosperous innkeeper into Seeker's Chariot. You know what happens? I'm pretty sure you just like win the game because at this point you are making tutus, gaining life when your tutus hit the board. And you can start doing that as early as turn four because the Seeker's Chariot can start attacking on turn three. On the play, that can just feel unfair. How do you beat this? Well, obviously, Wizards realizes that they fucked up. Made a mistake, that's why they nerfed it in Alchemy. But paper only folks, standard players, explorer players like myself, how do you play a Seeker's Trade? How do you play around the Seeker's Trade? So there's no single obvious hate card that gets it. It's just a very high value play, right? There's no one card you can sideboard that says, opponent cannot play a Seeker's Chariot and you draw three cards and win the game. Like, that sideboard card does not justifiably exist. So without, so without the existence of obvious hate, because there are cards you can obviously hate up like for a very long time. This was the pillar of our format, Cauldron Familiar and Witch's Oven. And Cauldron Familiar, Witch's Oven combo, you sacrifice the familiar to the oven to make food, and then you sacrifice. So let me just show you. Uh, whoopsie, then do that. Oven, 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 there we go. Okay. So, sacrifice this, make a food. Sacrifice a food, return familiar. Sacrifice familiar, make food. Sacrifice food, get back familiar. And you can just keep looping that combo. So, this is easy to hate up with cards like. If anything would die. It never dies. Everything is permanently always exiled. Called in familiar decks because they want to take advantage of things like Mayhem Double or almost always Black Red, which makes it very hard for them to deal with enchantments. So this is a clean sideboard answer that completely shuts down the strategy. There is nothing so obvious that you can do for a Zika's Chariot. It's very hard to just hate out. And when you're playing against sort of a fair aggro opponent, and you're like, okay, he's gonna go one drop, two drop, three drop. Um, suddenly they drop in the Zika's Chariot and Ren and Seven, it's like their turn one, two, three plays, which could have all killed me, still don't matter because Chariot by itself was pretty strong. And then combined with Ren and Seven, it just felt like it was insane. So, how do you beat it? How do you beat Chariot? Well, you have to analyze before you decide how you're going to tackle a card what the strengths of the card are. Why is it as good as it is? And we've established that here. It's a, it's a very early play in terms of the power and utility that it brings to the board. You're not expecting a four mana card to be able to do this. That's just, that's too much. So that's why it's so strong. This is something that comes ahead of curve. So are there tempo positive answers to Zika's Chariot? Answers that cost one, two, and three mana. Outside of, say, just counter magic. Counter magic is obviously a thing that you can do, by the way. And if you can make that a pot of your deck, so for example, let's say you're playing a blue base tempo deck, then you might have level internment or spell pierce, even. And cards like this, they make it very hard for your opponent to just cast a chariot. You can't just get them with counter magic. So this isn't a specific hate card. Level internment is a good card by itself. Spell pierce is live against a lot of other people who will be playing. Planeswalkers, instants, sorceries, enchantments, artifacts, you name it, right? Spell Pierce is very live. So if you're playing a deck that wants Spell Pierce and level internment, you already have potential ways to play around the Seeker's It's just another big, dumb, 
a four mana spell that might cause trouble for you if it resolves. Big deal. So that's one way to deal with it, right? Just counter it. If you can't counter it, then you have to realize, you have to ask, well, what colors am I looking for answers in? And so let's say you're playing mono white and you're trying to play specifically mono white aggro. And your plan is to play a bunch of little guys and then attack on the ground and then get through a bunch of damage by swarming the opponent. If Zika's Chariot is horrifying for you if you're trying to play uh, it, any kind of really go white right to the ground strategy, you can pick the mono white, which has synergies in its creatures rather than just like big creatures outright. Uh, like if you're trying to play like Dauntless Bodyguards and Chaplain of Arms, um, and even like Cold Spell Clerics or Fairy Guide Mothers or what have you, or Hopeful Initiate, I believe, is uh, the new hotness, which I don't have any of. Yeah, like these cards completely get blanked by Zeke's Chariot. However, there is hope. I mentioned Hopeful Initiate in particular because Hopeful Initiate has text. Not only does it get bigger when it attacks, which is already pretty good, the fact that every now and then you can remove plus one plus one creatures from one creature's control, which white places a lot of with things like Lumiarchus Tyrant, the fact that you can do that means a card, again, that you naturally want to put in your deck. Mono white aggro, not so full initiate, right? It's a one drop that grows itself. Also happens to deal with charity. You're not spending an extra card. You're not trying to find that one silver bullet that you need to draw in your deck of 60 cards to beat charity. It's just part of your core gameplay. It's the pillar of your deck is an answer to Zika's charity. And that's what you want to be. Ideally, your meta-breaking answers play an important role in your deck, and you're not just trying to tech against that one deck with bad thoughts. Like, if I was main decking Rest in Peace in a format where Cauldron and where Witches Oven and Cauldron Familiar are, is the primary graveyard shenanigans, then I am taking up slots in my deck to win more often against one deck in the format, and that means I'm giving up one percentage against all the other decks. And that's a very situational answer, and that's not good for anybody. Well, it's definitely not with you. So how do you beat them? How do you win against them without bringing in rest in peace in your main deck? You have to look for cards that are naturally good against things that want to go to the graveyard. And a very good example of card like that against Cold and Familiar would be Kalita's Trader of Get, which does not currently exist on, on Arena, but it really needs to because it is definitely a very important card in Pioneer. Pulls a lot of things together, goes black decks and out to fair black decks and out to nonsense. Uh, what Kalita's does is threat, 3-4, life hunger, whenever one token creature would die, Whenever a creature with a point of control to die, it's not token, it just doesn't die, exile it instead, you make a 2 So then what you're doing is essentially you are playing a good card that you would want to put in your deck anyway, and it just happens to line up really well against what the enemy is doing. And that is the same thing that we just saw with Hopeful Initiate and No Level One Terminal Sculptures. Now I'm not saying, hey, just play these cards and you're gonna be the Zika's Chariot and that's that's the good stuff, the Chariot Killer. I don't sound like the coolest serial killer in all of ancient Rome. It's that that sends the entirely the wrong message. Like the whole point is not that you're focused on killing chariot, it's just you know that pieces in your deck have what it takes to be this key piece that you know will be in other people's decks. And I'm not saying that's right, and I'm not saying it's fair that we should have to face against a card that's this obviously pushed, and that we should have to jump so many, through so many hoops, because I think it really takes away from a lot of what makes magic so wonderful, the fact that you can find your own strategy and express yourself. Now it's just more like, if you're playing green and you're not playing a Seeker's Chariot, why? And that kind of homogenizing, and do you have answers to Chariot? 
is really what keeps form and diversity down because of certain cards is much higher than all the other cards in terms of power level then if you want to win more often you should just be playing with the high power cards and not bothering with the others so that's part of the reason everyone is so happy with Toronto World Ring rotated out of standards because you could finally stop putting four Bone Crusher Giant and potentially some number of Ember Grief in every single red deck you play, you know? Um, but so, what are some other answers? You know, we've seen white, we've seen blue, we understand. White naturally has access to some disenchant effects. We also has access to flyers, things like Elite Spellbinder are incredible, right? If you're just trying to tempo the opponent out, you're just trying to aggro them down, take them to the skies is a very good option. You just want to play this card, this card is good. And on the face of it, this has nothing to do with the chariot. The thing is, it flies. So if they're trying to attack you with chariot, but you're just attacking for more in the air with Paladin class, Luna, Aspire, Delete, Spellbinder, you're still winning that race. And that's one way to quote unquote answer chariot. Because your cards are killing them more quickly than chariot will kill you. And that's a perfectly viable way to answer this strategy as well. So, what about red? Uh, the obvious sort of thing that comes to mind is something like a braid. Destroy an artifact. This still leaves the two to take care of, and you need to have a plan for that. If your primary plan in red is to use, say, red's artifact shattering abilities to get rid of the chariot and then deal with the cat some other way, you have to accept that a braid is by itself one for half against chariot. Unless you have a clean plan to mob up or neutralize the two twos, then you are still subjecting yourself to card disadvantage. So how might you do that? Well, let's say you have everybody's favorite new wrath, Meat of Massacre. If you're a deck that plays Meat of Massacre, just naturally, because let's say you're playing some version of Black Red Control, Marble Control, just Black Red Control, um, Rixus Control, what have you, even Jund, um, Midrange. So there, if you use your Artifact Destruction ability to get rid of the Chariot, and then you sweep away the opponent's board, you're presumably killing a bunch of his other stuff, and also taking the cats with you. At that point, a Grave has just one for one the Chariot, because Meat Hook Massacre cleaned up a lot of things, including the cats. So the cats did not gain any separate advantage, except maybe deal a couple of points of damage here and there. And that's the best case scenario, right? Where you are dealing with this card that has two separate effects, the chat, the vehicle effect that you need to stop and the tokens, and you're using two different parts of your deck to answer it in a card neutral way. A braid by itself goes down cards, Mythic Massacre by itself doesn't actually kill a chariot, but you combine the two, and suddenly now you have a way to answer the opponent's board and still somehow be up on cards, right? Wipe their board, presumably get at least two more creatures. So now let's say you've just killed those two creatures, also cleaned up the features here, and carry it up from the floor. That's, the, that's another approach that you can take. Instead of just being like, okay, I have this one set of cards in my deck, or this one group of cards that do this other thing that kills the chariot, um, this is an extension of that. This is instead of using one card, like Hopeful Initiate, or Elite Spellbinder, um, or other fires, now you're saying, well, I will go down a card, to tempo positively answer the chariot, cheap way to kill chariot, right? And then I have this other later plan to neutralize the two twos. That's completely fine as long as you're not just doing two separate things. So for example, if you're going Cry of the Carnarium only to kill the two twos, And then also using a break to kill the Seeker Chariot. Now you just use two cards and five mana to kill the four mana spell, and that is not great. So fair for fair decks, this is what you're looking at, right? For fair decks, you are looking at ways to interact with the opponent that does not require you to drastically change your game plan. So a Seeker Chariot is an example of a card that you need to fight against that's actively fair. So there's no one hate card against it, but also as a result, there's all these strategies that you can come up with. Against it. So in general, now that we understand the strength of this, how do you beat the Seeker's Chariot? You can fly over it, you can neutralize the tokens by having board wipes, you can have direct artifact or ar artifact removal in your main board uh, as part of your game plan, you can have counter magic. So there are ways that you can tech against the Chariot 
without completely warping your gameplay. It's good, but it's not broken. Let's pick a different example. One that does need silver bullets to deal with. Something that seems pretty hard to interact with on the face of it. Something that you know is going to be part of the meta. Something that, by the pricking of your thumbs, all Nixilis the adversary. This card is the nuts, obviously. Busted, right? Turn three, make two planeswalkers that make you discard cards or lose life. If you are applying any kind of pressure against the opponent's life total, my god, all Nixilis does. How do you beat all these things? Counter magic. Let's get him. Oh, copies himself. Counter magic is actually somehow not effective. Oh, makes you discard cards. So you could potentially try and switch to a strategy that likes having cards in the graveyard. But obviously you shouldn't only be playing graveyard based strategies just to prepare for Ob Nexilis. Well, you have to discard cards because it makes you lose life, so what if you could gain life? It doesn't mean you should be putting in cards like Revitalize in your deck, um, but it does mean that if you have built-in ways to gain life, like if you have life-linking threats, if you have drain effects, uh, if you have recurring life gain of some other source, then a lot of what Ob can do is mitigated. Like, let's say you're on Black White Angels and you're going uh, righteous Valkyrie into some other clerics and angels. You can just keep taking the damage from all. Like, you can discard a card here and there if you really want to. But now you're playing Flyers. You're playing Flyers that go over his devils and therefore can threaten all directly. And that also gain life. So you don't have to discard if you don't want to. You can just pay the life and you can get it back later. So Op has several different things that it does for you. It's making you lose life, it's putting profitable permanence in play, but really this repeated plus one is what makes it difficult. Occasionally making a devil is not what you're scared of Op. It's the fact that every turn you have to choose between discarding two cards and losing four life. That's what makes it difficult. So either mitigate the discard or mitigate the life loss. That's how you think about fighting Op. And again, notice this isn't like you're not teching to say things like, oh, well, I'll just like try to find this one card that says target opponent cannot cast Obnixilis and I get to burn all their Obnixili. Like, let's say such a card existed. If you main deck that and your opponent is playing anything other than Obnixilis, like even if you're playing against an opponent with Obnixilis in their deck, their deck presumably has other cards in it. So if you uber tech, now you are completely useless against all of that other stuff that you're doing. And generally speaking, these decks that play powerful cards do not solely rely on the strength of those cards to win. Uh, most of the fair decks today uh, are constructed such that they have multiple angles of attack and multiple threats. And also, if you have like two cards that are, or three cards even, that are really good against all the sideboard, uh, that say target player cannot cast all Nixilis, all of Nixilis and target players' hand and library at the end of each game will be exiled and then burned. Um, you still need to draw that sideboard card. And Ob is so cheap. If you don't draw and cast, your target player cannot play Ob Nixilis permanent emblem on turn or on or before turn three, and Ob lands. And then what do you do? You know, you haven't drawn your sideboard card. Cannot shut down the orb. Pithing Needle is a good example of this. If you you might want Pithing Needle against other activated abilities, right? If you're suspecting a lot of planeswalkers in the meta, Pithing Needle is a very decent answer. But you're playing what two tops three Pithing Needles in your sideboard? What happens when you don't draw them? Then how do you deal with all? So this is what I call the silver bullet approach to trying to just tech against something, which is I have this one card that is really good 
against what my opponent is trying to do. But this one card that is really good against what my opponent is trying to do, I didn't draw it. And now I have no answers for it, and it's still just wrecking me. That's not how you want to think about Meta Break, ever. Because you're going too far down the rabbit hole of, I need to draw the right silver bullet at the right time against the right opponent. And that's a lot of asks. It is significantly better to see if you can't construct your deck in a way that gets around what your opponent might be able to use against you. So a lot of aggressive decks, back when we were playing against Bone Crusher Giant, just accepted. Bone Crusher Giant exists. So sometimes my creatures are going to get killed and I'm going to get two for them. It's going to feel bad. But that's the risk we take when we play aggro. Opponent might have good removal. Obviously, this is extremely pushed in terms of how good removal can be because it's a removal spell that then becomes a creature on curve by itself. It's, it, it threatens, it defends, it, it's just so good against opposing aggressive strats. So if they're going to kill a thing and then stand tall, potentially one way to deal with that is by going wide. Bone Crusher Giant is notoriously bad against a whole lot of tokens. Uh, dumping a token doesn't feel great and then Okay, I have a 4-3, but if my opponent still has 4-1-1 one, one tokens, and I manage to pump with an Anthem, still not feeling very good about that spot, right? So, that's an example of how you would think about approaching how to beat this card. It's, it's not just about, oh, they have Bone Crusher Giant, uh, so I'm going to try to make sure that they don't play red spells. It's Bone Crusher Giant deals 2 damage, so maybe if I'm playing not an aggro deck, I can mitigate the number of things that have two toughness. Um, if I'm playing aggro, then I need to make sure I go wide, so that I'm not reliant on my one true drop that then gets stomped and then I cry and I lose. So that's building your deck with these cards in mind. Another thing that you can do against top, for example, by this approach, is if it makes you discard, it makes your choice between discard and game life. If you can discard, you have to lose life. If you can gain life, then you focus on the discard. And if you don't want to put things in the graveyard, well then just have extra cards to discard. That is a way to deal with discard. If, you ha if you're drawing a bunch of extra cards, then it shouldn't be too hard to keep finding things to throw away. Like lands, or what have you. So if you are playing a deck that is able to put a large number of cards into your hand, then Obnixil's feels really, really bad. Also, notice, this is just against the fact that he has a plus one. Like, he's also a planeswalker that has to sit on the battlefield. He's harder to remove than other planeswalkers because he copies himself, but he doesn't protect himself that well. He has no removal. He just makes one blocker on the ground, two if he's lucky. And then that leaves both of the ops really low. So just like we talked about with the Brave Meat of Massacre combo, now what you can do is when the ops are low, you can just strangle an Ob Nixilis and then let Meat of Massacre or some other sweeper finish off the rest. Or you can just have flyers like Rafine. Just get over the top in the air and just kill the Ob. These are all approaches against Ob. This is all, I will play more flyers. I will have cards that draw cards. These are ways to not just say, oh, I'm going to hate this card, I'm taking against it, but I've built my deck in such a way that even if I see my opponent with this card, I still have this game plan that I can execute that is parallel to and supportive of my original game plan that will help me blank whatever my opponent is doing here. So for example, if you're expecting a lot of Rafines, what's a card that is good against Ward? Cards that say can't be countered, for example. So Voidrend is in the same colors, you can Voidrend Rafine um, if you're playing Esper Colors. If you're not playing Esper Colors, well, you can play other cheap removal and pay the ward cost for one. If you're playing Infernal Grasp, pay the extra one, get rid of the Rafine. If you're playing red, you need something that deals four damage. Slash can't be countered. So if you're expecting a lot of Rafine, 
maybe pack heated debates in the sideboard. Not the best card, 3 mana deal 4 damage. However, it's removal, 3 mana removal, but it is removal. And it gets around Rafine's wall quite nicely. So there are definitely ways to play around Rafine. It's easier, in fact, to play around something like Rafine than it is to play against all races. Creatures are generally easier to remove. Let's use this the next thing as an example. I don't think initially people realized how good this card was. Wedding announcement, right? People thought, oh, Mono White already has 73 drops, it's glutted, and you've got Skyclave Apparitions, and Brutal Cathars, and Alawines, and Elite Spellbinders. Like, I just want to. Paolo Vida and Little Rosa designed Elite Spellbinder theory to be the quintessential white three drop. Tempo, pressure, disruption. It is the perfect hate bear. Really good aggro card, really good fair card. And then Wizards just kept printing so many other good cards in the three drop slot that we didn't even get to play four copies of Elite Spellbinder in every single white deck we saw. Like people legitimately thought that yes, Spellbinder's good, but there are other things that are competing with it for the slots, like Padawan and that, and Brutal Puzzle. That's still crazy. Anyways, getting up, getting sidetracked. Wedding announcement because of all the hype around like three drops ended up not being on too many people's radars initially when it was dropped, but then people quickly realized, oh, I mean yes, you can be aggressive with this card, but oh my god, does it go well if you're trying to play a slower game. The tokens can chomp and provide defense if you're on the fence. The drawing extra cards is fantastic. And then if you have any sort of token generation. And it doesn't have to be just, oh, raise the alarm and open up the sun. Um, you can be playing things like Wolf and Soren play, and Kaito Shizuki, plane swappers that make tokens consistently recurring. The Wandering Emperor, right? And all of those get buffed by wedding festivity. So a card that makes blockers slash attackers pumps your whole team and potentially draws you cards, that's definitely something you'd be interested in, right? So how do you beat a card like Wedding Announcement? Well, again, what is Wedding Announcement weak to? Wedding Announcement, like Ob, really does not hold early pressure. Ob makes one creature and leaves one copy at high loyalty and one copy at low loyalty. And if you're just rushing out onto the board, if you've got flyers, you can nick that down. Wedding announcement, similar. Turn you play it, it'll make a 1 1. 3 mana 1 1. Not very exciting. If you have pressure on the board, if you're playing a strategy that can apply pressure as early as turn 1, 2, 3, then the person playing wedding announcement is forced into this defensive mode where they never really get to spread the board with creatures because they have to keep chump blocking and then they're never able to take full advantage of their anthem effect or their card draw effect because they keep losing creatures to not die to you and so on and so forth, right? So when you analyze what a card can do, what it's good at, you also have to understand that it's not allowed to break the rules of magic. Like, Yes, wedding announcement is a good card, all misses are good cards, but they still cost mana. They can still be engaged in, uh, engaged against in combat, and so on and so forth. And that is why a few times that you have something truly unfun and unfair, it feels so bad. When I realized this was legal and explorer, I could have played it. I have collected my copies of Omnath over, over the years, got my wall cards for them too. And I just refused. I outright refused to play this card. Because on principle, I don't think this card should exist. It's the same reason I will never play a deck like Tron in Modern. It's not that it's unplayable or even great necessarily, it's just as a concept, what it does goes against what I think magic ought to look like. And that is a fair, if not a fair game, at least an interactive game, where it's not just two ships passing in the night. Modern and Legacy have had this problem for, for a while, right? 
just people throwing their cards at each other to see whose pile wins first. That is just not fun. And when you're playing against the people who are playing Omnath, they have Lotus Cobra and Omnath in play. Turn four, they're suddenly like, I have 16 lands in play. I've cast Genesis Ultimatum twice. I've dealt eight damage to you, nuked all your planeswalkers. Uh, I, I also have gained a surprisingly large amount of life, and it's just. It's kind of busted. Like. This is not a fair magic card. And by f not fair, I don't just mean it's not fair against you. I mean, it's just in general, it's not a card that's playing magic, quote unquote, the way it's supposed to be played. Have a fixed amount of mana, make your land drops, um, get mana from your lands, play your spells, right? This is, I'm playing a four mana creature. But I'm not losing any cards for it. Okay, so that's just like a good value play. But then, just for playing lands, for helping trigger extra landfalls, all of these extra effects that are all quite strong and somehow really, really powerful in conjunction. Like if Omnath didn't do all of these things, it would be a lot less strong. In the alchemy version of Omnath, uh, it doesn't draw a card when it hits the field. And that is intentional. Because part of what makes this card threatening is the fact that at the worst it's just a threat that cycles itself. But then, if you turn four, after you're on top with a turn three on that, you play a Fable Passage, instantly make four extra mana. Now you have nine mana, or eight mana, depending on if you're a Lotus or if you're a Lotus, but you have ten mana. Turn four. If you have Lotus Cobra on that in play, and you play a Fable Passage, let that sink in. Fourth line, play a Fable Passage. If your opponent has played their three drop, or a removal spell, or some kind of interactive card, or just play two creatures to the board and they're playing aggro. And you're like, oh, turn four, make ten mana. Traditionally, in order to be able to make that amount of mana, players have had to do a lot of work. They've had to go turn one mana door, turn two mana door, turn three ramp spell, and then turn four, if nothing has been killed and the ramp spell resolved, we will have seven or eight mana. This just completely defies that, right? This just makes it so easy. Play a fetch land. And here you go. Here's four extra mana. In the early turns, that is incredibly potent. This card is not trying to play fair. This card is trying to turn four, cast Genesis Ultimatum, and not by doing stupid shit like the Tibble Strictly decks, which are just like, maybe this will come together, and when it does, it'll be cool, but a lot of the time it'll just fail. Ramnath doesn't like that. Even if he's not letting you cheat on resources, by refilling your hand, making you a bunch of mana, giving you a bunch of life back, even hitting the opponent and their, their planeswalkers. Even if you don't let it do all of that, it's still 4 out of 4 for the dual card. This, the ceiling on Omnath is so high and the floor is so low that unless you can just stop the other player from casting the spell, either with counter magic or by extracting this card out of your opponent's deck, you're going to get two for one at worst. At worst for the Omnath player, that is at best for you. And in the best case scenario for the Omnath player, where you do not have an instant speed removal spell for the Omnath, or you do not have an ins or do not have some other form of removal ready right away for the Omnath after they have cast them past the turn, you suddenly feel so far behind. Like it does not feel good in any way, shape, or form. And the fact remains that you don't have to have the ideal Lotus Cobra Omnath locus of creation uh, draw in order to 
go off. Like, you can just play Omnath fairly. Charm 5. Play Omnath for 4 mana. Fable Passage. Crack Fable Passage. Suddenly I have 5 mana still. I, my 4 mana creature has cycled itself both in cards and in mana. I just added a free 4 4 to the board. That can do this every time. And I can cast something like an Escape to the Wilds, which is a draw 5. Unless we play an extra land, triggers Omnath. Then you just get so far ahead in resources. You're supposed to draw one card a turn, and you're supposed to have a limited amount of mana out with which to cast that one card. Traditionally, if you want to draw extra cards, you have to spend mana for it. You have to spend your turns beholding the multiverse and um, waiting for the ancestral visions to come off. But this asks nothing of you. Draws your card right away, makes your mana for very little effort, does all of the things very easily, recurrently, and if you don't have instant speed removal and your opponent plays an Omnath, they can still just play it out, pop off, playing it on their turn, and holding the fetch land. That's all it takes. And with a little support, this little guy goes very long. So how do you beat Omnath? With a card this powerful that can do so many things once it hits the board, the reason I say this is unfair and unfun is not only can you not tech against it because this is intended to be quote unquote a fair card like this isn't a oh i'm playing this card in a way that magic isn't traditionally played i'm trying to find specific cards put them in my graveyard and then get them out of the graveyard um by casting spells by casting relatively cheap spells that can get back seven and eight drops like this isn't just reanimated where they're set up more this is just a fair card you're just playing this with no setup getting a four mana four for the draws card and then getting all these extra effects and the potential to just win the game and explode all your lands onto the deck, or out of your deck onto the table in just one turn without potentially you being even able to interact if you don't have instant speed interaction. So this is intended to be a fair card that is so far above what fair play can accomplish in Magic. I think this is genuinely unfun and should not exist. Uh, it should not exist in Pioneer. It should not exist. It do, rightly does not exist in standard, and definitely should not exist in explorer. So, how would you deal with a card like Omnath? To deal with fair cards, as we've seen, there's no single tech. There's no rest in peace that deals with Omnath. Uh, one thing you could do is you could look to see if you have something that stops permanents triggering their abilities when something hits the battlefield. Something like a torpor orb, but that again is a silver bullet solution you can't really build your deck around something like proper orb um fair decks just take the beating just accept the l you're going to go down a card but you have to kill it you need to make sure you have enough interaction against this to not die and blue mages you can still just like on magic it's still a dumb form on a spell on the stack um, black mages, you can get it with Thoughtseize. This is one of the reasons that counter magic and Thoughtseize is understand that it's fun for a lot of people are important pillars of any healthy format. Because then people who are trying to play these overpowered cards can get really punished by having their overpowered cards taken from them. Uh, and similarly, while I'll never play aggro myself and like it, um, I will also recognize that aggro is an important pillar of a healthy format because it forces everybody to not just do nothing, to have interaction, to have things to do in the early game. Keeps people honest is the expression, right? So on that, this isn't about keeping people honest. This card, it says, kill me right now and I'll, or I'll win the game. And if you don't kill me right now, you're dead. And even if you do, I'm still ahead in cards because I drew a card when I hit the board, right? So this is much harder to tech against, and when the meta has cards like this, it just feels not great. Uh, by contrast, when the meta has other powerful cards that are not necessarily just, you know, like un just so far pushed, like cards with clear strengths and weaknesses, you can attack this, right? Emberclay, whoa, I don't want to crap Emberclay. Emberclay, what you can do is you can say, well, uh, this only is good if the opponent has a lot of attacking creatures. So I will make sure the board is always relatively clear. You could be playing a control or a mid rangey deck um, that likes keeping the board low on creatures. And that would really hinder the opponent's ability to play Emberclay. 
Also, you could just have artifact removal in your deck that also does other things, things like hold on to and a braid. So there are clear answers to the power of Embercleave. And again, you're not teching against it necessarily, not trying to hope and pray for silver bullets. You're trying to realize when this card is strong and under what circumstances it is not strong, and you're trying to exploit that if any. The thing about on math is there are so few circumstances in which it is not strong that there are no clear avenues to punish it. That's why it's an exception, and that's why things like Oppo are banned. Because if any mode of punishment that you can think of leaves the Oppo player significantly advantaged. Um, you try to play creatures to get rid of Oppo. Oppo can make a steady stream of 3 threes, or turn your best creatures into 3 threes that are then easily removed. Oko was too broken. He was a worse version of Almanac because he was a planeswalker, which is even harder to interact with than a creature. And he was also only two powers for some time. That's four. Um, I'm not saying that justifies Almanac's existence, but I am explaining why Oko is much more broken than Almanac. So we've seen now a few ways that you can deal with meta cards. Um, We've seen examples in Zika's Chariot, of Nixilis, and then cards from older standard formats that are so legal to explore. We sort of analyze strengths and weaknesses and see how to try and understand what approach shuts them down. So let's apply it to a couple of generically picked cards. So let's say you're playing against Mono White, and you have an Adeline that you're playing against. Card is very good. You will lose to it a lot of the time. If your opponent just has turn one creature, turn two creature, or creature creature, and then turn three Adeline, you suddenly are getting attacked by three, four creatures on turn three of the game, and it just, they still have this massive vigilant threat left over. What? So, what's the plan there? Adeline can be one for one. She can be removed, play removal. Um, Adeline is really weak when she has no supporting cast. Trying to keep the board clear can be removed. So, Adeline does not do favorably into removal. So if you really want to consistently beat an aggressive modern white deck, pack a bunch of removal, but then be flexible about it, right? Have removal that can also be good against mono green, have ways to get rid of that removal and trade it in for other cards if you're not against somebody who cares about you having all this removal. So whenever you are analyzing a format pillar, what does it do? Why is it so strong? That is the first question you should ask. Question number two, what are the, the effects that were identified that make it strong? What are the things that I can do that will make me not care about that effect? If Zika's Chariot floods the board, comes up the ground completely, and tries to attack you, what can I do to nullify that? If the ground is gummed up, I can go to the air. If Zika's Chariot is trying to race me, I can try and deal more damage more quickly. Or I can just kill it. Same goes even on. Trying to make me discard slash lose life. If I gain life, that doesn't work. If I like discarding cards, that doesn't work. Also, if I have extra cards to discard all the time, that doesn't work. Those are ways to fight Ob. Also, Ob is pretty weak against opposing board presence. And Ob Nixilis on the play on turn three, casual decay is pretty strong. And an Ob Nixilis in that same situation against Adeline and a bunch of creatures that are already there in play. It's much worse because now it can get attacked down much more easily. So it's really about just identifying what are the things, in the third step, what are the things that the card I'm worried about cannot do? And then just twist the knife in there. So, one, why is the card strong? What are the effects that it has? Number two, what can I do to counter those effects? And number three, what does the card not do? And how do I take advantage of the fact that there's a gap in its ability? Because no card just says, do everything, opponent can't do anything, you win the game. Even pushed cards have weaknesses, unless they're on that, in which case Wizards was just smoking all the good shit. There was no way they didn't see on that being that strong. And they were like, oh, it's just going to be a commando card. Like, dude, what are you smoking? Anyways, um, hopefully that gave you a bit of an idea of how to evaluate cards on an individual level so the next time you're looking at pioneer explorer standard district whatever you just keep losing to this one card over and over again hopefully this gives you a slightly better idea of how to plan against it and play around it later on 
I will probably be doing more videos about how to play and play against specific decks and specific metas, but this is sort of just a general all-purpose introduction to how we analyze cards. We'll get to how to analyze decks uh, and how to figure out how to beat those decks later on. So hopefully you learned something, hopefully this was useful. Until next time, have a wonderful day. Peace.